welcome you all uh, to our beautiful senior center. Uh, happy National Hot Dog Day. <laughs> I, uh, I just, I worked at Rutgers in New Brunswick, and there's a place called Destination Dog. So I went there to celebrate National Hot Dog Day. <laughs> Uh, but we're here for something a little more serious. Um, so, this has been a presentation that our police have been doing now for about a year and a half, two years. Um, quite frankly, a little bit longer in regards to scams, but because of the recent uh, car thefts that have been running rampant nationwide, uh, we've included uh, a little bit more. So, this is the second time that we've had the presentation here. We had it a few months ago. Here, and then as well as the community center. Uh, we are recording tonight's presentation to again put it out on our website. Because you'll see one of the most important things that can happen here, twofold. One is educating you but also giving you the information and that power to potentially help others. And if you wouldn't just indulge me, just for a moment, I tell this story, and I, I tell it every time we do the presentation, about a personal issue, matter, that occurred with my family. Um, about a year ago, I went to go visit my mom. She lives up in Woodbridge Township, nine years old. Oh, how you doing with all the mayor stuff, honey? I'm like, I'm doing good, Mom. Thank you for asking. I said, you know, we've really been doing a lot with the police and scams and trying to get people involved with, with the information of just watch yourself and watch others. And my mom says, oh, we have that. I know you don't answer the phone if you don't know. Like, good, Mom. Thank you. Thank you so much. Well, Subsequently, a few weeks later, in a moment of weakness, the phone was ringing at my mom's house, and she answered it. And on the phone, the person who was calling says, Grandma, could you please help me? <clears throat> this is Sean, her deaf uh, adult uh, grandson. Oh my gosh, are you okay? No, Grandma, I'm not okay. I'm in jail in New York. I got into a car accident. I hit somebody. She's pregnant. She's in the hospital. Please, please don't tell my dad, but I need money to get out of jail. My mom, and we all have, you know, listen, we all have that good heart, right? We want to help, especially a, a family member. So my mom says, Okay, what can I do? Uh, give me your credit card number. My mom doesn't have the credit card number to give out. What else can I do? How can you go to the bank and I'll and my lawyer will send a courier over? My mom, in a walker, nine years old, hung up the phone. They don't bother calling any of the sons. Us. She went next door with her walker and asked the neighbor, could you please take me to the bank? Neighbor said, sure. Neighborly takes my mom to the bank. My mom withdraws $9,000 in cash. She comes home. She calls the you know, lawyer. The lawyer says, Mrs. I will send a courier over. About an hour later, a courier comes knocking on the door. My mom hands over $9,000 in cash to the courier. That's the end of the story. So all it may have taken is maybe just one question. Maybe my neighbor, why do you, what, you know, what are you going to the bank for? Uh, or, you know, come on, mom. You know, give us a call. Weren't we just talking about it? I'll let that one go. Um, you know, and I even thought about, well, can't like the bank 
ask as well. And again, I don't get it. I'm not in the banking business, and therefore. So what it might take is a presentation like this. And so as the proud mayor of Monroe Township, I always tell how safe our community is. And truly, it starts with our police. But it's a team effort as well. And you being here is part of that team effort to get the information, the correct information, by our trained professionals. And they're going to tell you some stories, but they're going to provide that information that maybe might help you. But now you have that information, potentially you might be able to help somebody else. So thank you for being here. Thank you for making Monroe one of the safest cities, towns in the nation. And I give you our detectives, Detective O'Brien, Detective Bennett, of our Monroe Police Department. And again, thank you.
becoming a more common thing. Everybody was, you know, complacent. You live in a great place. All right? You, we should be able to live free and do what we want. I should be able to leave my car key in the console and the, and the cup holder if I want. But unfortunately, we don't want to turn our cars over to these criminals. So we were telling everybody, lock your doors. Take your keys, bring them inside. Well, now the criminals were like, well, I still want that car. And so now they were going into the homes to take the keys to leave. So anytime there's horseshoes, then that becomes a robbery. Okay, so that's the difference between a burglary, a robbery, and a home invasion is where they're intending to invade the house, uh, subdue the residents that are in the house uh, for the purpose to commit a crime. So we have not had home invasions here in, in quite a while, and I don't know we hope that continues. So burglary statistics, in 2019, there were an estimated 1,100,000 burglaries, a decrease of 9.5% when compared to the 2018 data. The number of burglaries decreased 29% when compared to the 2015 data, and was down 48% when compared to the 2010 data. Burglaries account for 16% of the estimated number of property crimes. By subcategory, 57% of burglaries involve forcible entry. That means somebody blasts in your door. They break the rear slider. They force their way into your house. We do have instances where somebody leaves a door unlocked. You'd be surprised how common that is. Somebody leaves a window unlocked. And now they're granted access into the house. That's not forced entry when they have the ability to get into the house. It's still a burglary, but it just changes the subcategory of forced entry. Um, victims of burglary offenses suffered an estimated $3 billion in property losses. The average dollar loss per burglary is $2,600. We've seen burglaries where people have lost a necklace, a cell phone, a wallet with 50 bucks in it. And we've seen burglaries where people have lost over a million dollars in cash, $500,000 in jewelry, pocketbooks, things like that. So, you know, how these people pick their, their, their targets, we don't necessarily know that. You know, when we catch these people afterwards, we ask them, and a lot of the times it really is truly about randomness. There are some burglary rings that are going around that are targeting, targeting specific, specific people, such as business owners. People that own pharmacies, people that may own restaurants, dry cleaners, nail salons, because those businesses deal with a lot of cash. And so those people have a tendency to have more cash in their homes. So those homes are being targeted for that reason. So we're dealing with a lot of different groups that are doing these burglaries, and each one has a different purpose or a different motive or reason for doing what they do. This, uh Real quick, with the, the staff, don't get too caught up on that. It says 2019, the FBI hasn't come out with a new uh, stat yet or recent, so don't get too caught up on that. And like Bennett said, we're dealing with different groups of criminals, okay? Different well trained organizations. Um, these individuals are trained. We have residential burglary crews. Um, they're generating from South America, they're coming up, they're being trained um, on how to target certain people. Um, like Ben said, business owners. It's a huge one going on right now. Um, cash businesses, huge. Um, th these burglars are doing surveillance, they're putting cameras out, GPS is on cars. Um, these are your top tier criminals because it's a well oiled machine organization. Then we're dealing with the car burglars um, and people that are stealing the cars. That is more of a juvenile, um, organized, it's still organized crime. Um, a lot of these cars are either getting used in the commission of other crimes, gang related uh, crimes, or they're being shipped uh, out of the country, they're being rebid and shipped out of the country. Um, that's kind of what we're dealing with. And then the third group we're dealing with are for lower level um, people that are either down on their times, um, people that may be in, in drug use and stuff like that. We, we call that petty burglary stuff, going into cars, stealing the loose change. You know, in the adult community sometimes um, we have people, you know, their kids are living with them, they'll go around and, and they'll take advantage of that. Um, just taking little knickknacks and stuff like that just to get the edge off have an addiction problem or something like that. 
So those are like the three tiers of criminals we're dealing with. Um, it's not kind of like the old days when you see the people with the ski mask on and the, the crowbar. And, you know, a lot of these burglaries now from these well-organized crime on the South American crews that we're seeing, um, they're dressed normal. They look like regular people. They're out in the day. Um, burglaries are happening during the day. They're watching people. They're watching when they go to work, when they come home from work, uh, when they go to the food store, when they're back. Um, we've seen some burglaries. They're executed within three minutes. Um, we'll get into the whole alarm system and cameras and all that, but I just wanted to paint a picture. That's what we're dealing with. Um, in the car thefts, most of them, I would say probably 85 to 90 percent are juveniles committing these crimes, but they're being um, told to do these crimes from uh, you know, a leader of this organization. So we'll get into the whole criminal code, not really, but we'll explain why we're using the juveniles uh, to commit these crimes. And just so you guys are aware, 90 percent-ish, I would say, uh, they do not want to hurt people. They want no confrontation with you at all. They want to avoid it at all costs. Um, so we'll give you some tips on how to make your house and your lifestyle look like someone's home. Um, we'll get into that a little bit later. You know, the, the tips we're going to discuss isn't a uh, end-all, be-all on protecting yourself. It's going to help. Some of you live in gated communities where there might be a homeowners association and some of the things we've discussed you may not be allowed to do due to the fact there's probably specific rules that dictate how you can decorate, add lights, things like that to your house. So, I mean, these things, again, are just suggestions. You know, we're seeing, this is, in this day and age, everybody has cameras. Cameras are not deterring a single soul from doing any of these crimes. I'm telling you right now. They run up to every home business. They're running through the front doors. The first thing you're doing is they're looking right up at the camera. We're getting beautiful face shots. But a lot of these people are coming from countries outside of the U.S., and so they're being brought in to do these crimes, and they're not being picked up on our facial recognition. We can't get a match through DMV because they don't have a license here. Things like that. So 20 years I've been doing this job. Now, 15 years ago, 20 to 15 years ago, we were having neighborhood burglars. When we had a burglary, we would find out, okay, who's got the drug addiction? Who has somebody who just got out of jail recently? Who's somebody who's down on their luck? Things like that. That's what we would focus to try to solve these crimes, and we did extremely well with this. Now it's evolved into, just like Detective O'Brien said, these bigger organized rings, and they're moving people everywhere around the country, up and down the East Coast, and they'll target, they'll saturate an area for a week, and then they're out here in Massachusetts, they're in Baltimore, they're in... Pennsylvania, then they're down in Florida. And we're seeing these messages with the same burglars we just had in our town are showing up four states away a day later. So there are so many task forces that have been created to try to counter this. Where it's not becoming a local issue anymore, we need to work with all these other agencies, state agencies, federal agencies, in order to try to counter this because, you know, they're not local people anymore. That's the thing. So we'll start off with the house stuff here. 34% um, of burglaries occur through the front door of your residence. Um, we've been seeing people dressed as florists, flower delivery services, coming to your door, holding a bouquet of flowers, knocking on the front door. Oh, nobody answers. Let me walk around the back, looking like you're going to put the flowers in the back door. They're just making sure there's nobody in the backyard. They're looking through windows as they walk by to see if there's somebody in the kitchen. And then they'll usually break into the house in there. There's two other people that are waiting out by the road because they drove this person there. And now you've got two or three people going into the house. They're posing as Amazon delivery drivers. That's a common one now because Amazon people, if there's holiday time, they employ additional drivers. And they don't have an Amazon truck, so they use their personal vehicles. So it's not uncommon to see somebody wearing a reflective vest, running packages from a car to a house up and down the street during the months of November and December. In the summertime, it's still happening. And they're going to the front door, posing as some type of delivery person, knocking on the door. If you have to answer the door, you make up some sort of story. And, you know, you think nothing of it. Okay, they were looking for the wrong house. They knock on my door by accident. And you just let it go. They get the car, they go someplace else. So we're seeing a lot of these different people posing um, as common people to try to, you know, uh, conduct these crimes. We are seeing a little bit more of a second floor entry into some of these homes. 
Uh, the technical mind would comment that this is because of more of a South American burglary group. This is their method of operation. We say MO, right? Now, what's the MO? The MO method of operation. That is, they're going through the second floor windows. They'll take picnic tables, put a doghouse on top of the picnic table, and then put a pool ladder on top of that to gain access to the roof to go into the master bedroom through that window because those windows are usually not alarmed. And it puts them right into the room where the valuables are that they are looking for, the cash and the jewelry that they want, without traipsing through the rest of the house leaving evidence behind, without tripping motion sensors, without coming across dogs that may be in the house. And so we're starting to see a little bit more of that. Um, just real quick, um, I don't know if everyone's probably the Citrus style homes. Um, another common trend we're seeing right now with the car burglars. The, if you have a garage, you have windows in your garage, um, they got to be locked. They have to be locked. They're, they're jumping into those, and then once they get in your garage, what they're doing is the garage door from your house into your garage. Most people don't lock it. You'd be surprised at night. They'll just go right into your house, find your pocketbook on the, on the key hook, right in the garage, right up. As soon as you walk in, take your keys, and they're gone. Um, we're seeing a when I say we seeing, that means the whole state. I uh, just want to sidebar real quick. He's been on it for almost 20 years. I've been on eight years. He, from eight years on, he's probably seen the biggest change. So the amount of information and intelligence sharing going on throughout the state and the country, from federal agencies, state agencies, to local municipalities like ours, is unbelievable. It's unprecedented. It is, it is far beyond it's ever been, and it's getting better each day. So when I say we, I mean, we get emails daily uh, for intelligence. That's what I'm talking about, the trends that we're seeing basically on the East Coast, narrow down to New Jersey, Middlesex County, and therefore. So that's the trend we're starting to see now with the auto thefts. They're going into windows just to keep, take your keys and, and bounce. The second store windows, you have to lock them. Backsliding doors is the big one we're seeing right now because everyone, if you have a sliding glass door, you have an alarm, you have the motion sensor there, right? And it opens if your thing or tells you. These burglars are smart. They'll blast out your glass because you don't have a glass break. Glass break sensors are fairly new, common for the last 10 to 15 years. Um, so glass break sensors are pretty big. Um, that's how they get around it, because you'll never get the alarm going off because the slider's never opening. It's glass break, they wear hooded sweatshirts, they run right through the glass, and they go right to the master bedroom. We'll talk a little bit more about the master bedroom and stuff like that uh, coming up. You know, when um, somebody had asked to start it, it's about why are these becoming so much more common? Why is this becoming so much more of an occurrence we're seeing in the news now? Because it wasn't always like this. And what we see, what we're seeing in, in the difference, the main difference here is that we are out doing our jobs in the sense that we're, we're researching this, we're doing canvassing in neighborhoods, we're, we're finding out these suspects, we're charging them, we're arresting them, okay? And, and we're finding, we're having success across the state. And what happens after the arrest is where now things have deviated from the past. So now we go through all the trouble of doing cell phone records to put people in places and confirm that they were there, that they were the one that drove the vehicle, they were the one that went in the house. And we get all these records, and we do all these subpoenas and search warrants for all of this stuff. And we go through all this site work, and we lock this person up. Well, in the past, we call the judge and say, Your Honor, I got this guy. He's done seven burglaries. He's responsible for about 20 others in other towns. And the judge would say, You know what? Put this guy in jail for a bit. Set a bail of $500,000. And this man would sit in jail for months until their trial came around. And they were not a problem to anybody else again because they were sitting in jail. New Jersey has deviated from that system and has gone bail reform. There is no bail anymore. Okay, so now it's up to somebody to determine after we make the arrest, was there uh, violence in this crime? Like they use certain factors like that to determine is this person safe to release? Or do we need to keep them off the streets? And a majority of the time they're being released. And they're being released within a day, two days, sometimes four hours of us taking them to the county. They are out right after. And so that's what we want everybody to understand. Why this is becoming so much more prolific is because of the fact there is no punishment right now. Okay, there's no accountability. We're doing our job, I assure you. 
We're working our behind them to do this. And so is every other police officer in the state of New Jersey. That this has become a mission of ours because we live in the same neighborhood you do. Okay? We are victims of this stuff as well, and we don't want it in our neighborhoods. But when the next level of the justice system decides that, well, let's let these people out, and they promise to come to court in four months, they promise yeah. not to reoffend in that time, and so we take your word for it, go ahead home. And so what happens? These juveniles that are doing these vehicle thefts are back out the next night doing the vehicle thefts all over again. We found people that we've arrested with 70 pages of criminal history at the age of 14 years old. Is that all right? So that's where the big difference has, has, you know, from the past to now, that to us is the one distinguishable difference that has made this so much more lucrative is the fact that now you don't have the penalty to go into crime like before. And he mentioned they're not targeting the individuals within the house. They don't want a confrontation because now, if in the middle of the night you hear a bump and you walk out the hallway and now somebody's standing in your hallway and they knock you to the ground, that now becomes a robbery. That robbery charge will pretty much guarantee they're not going to come out of jail for a period of time. They don't want that. That's why they're just interested in getting keys, getting the pocketbook, and getting that out of the house. They don't want to be there any longer than they have to. They don't want that confrontation because a third degree burglary charge, I'm not going to jail for that. A second degree robbery charge, well, okay, now I've got a bit of a problem, and I won't be out doing this again for a little while. So this is where the difference is, and this is where we're trying to get our lawmakers, our state lawmakers. It's not a municipal thing, it's not a local thing, it's not a county thing, it's a state level issue. New York is dealing with the same thing because New York followed suit with us and decided to eliminate they fail. So this is the problem that we're seeing. Uh, distraction burglaries. This is amping up a lot in the state right now. Uh, so what they do is there's a couple different uh, styles of it. Distraction burglaries. They'll come up to you, say you're outside, cut your grass, you're sitting out there having a cup of coffee, You'll see a car pull up in your driveway. Maybe you'll walk out to it. Hey, you'll say, uh, I'm lost, uh, or it's a beautiful house. You know, and that will target the elderly community. Um, that's what they do, these, these, these types. And they'll be like, oh, can you try this necklace on? It looks so beautiful on you, right? So you'll take your necklace off, and they'll put their fake gold or diamond or, uh, necklace on you, or ring, whatever it might be. They'll distract you and get into a conversation, and then they'll drive away. Once they're gone, they're gone. You don't even realize you still have their necklace on, and they just took, you know, your mother's golden necklace or wedding ring that you took off real quick to put that ring on. Um, that's a big one. Another big distraction one we're seeing is bank follow-ups. Um, if you go to a bank and you're taking out a large sum of money, or you driving this car, or a flashy handbag, or something like that. These guys are, and girls, are in the bank. They look like regular people. They're, like again, try to get out of that mindset of a ski mask and a crowbar. They look like regular people that are dressed. They'll go in line, and they're watching them. So what will happen is you'll walk to your car, you'll put your handbag in, in your front seat, or in the back seat. You might stop at a stopping shop, or a Dunkin' Donuts, go inside with a friend, or go to the community clubhouse, whatever you may be, and you leave your person there. I'm just running in to get some milk or some deli meat or whatever it might be. And they'll pull up next to your car, smash the window, take your purse, and be gone. Okay, that's a big one. Another one too, they'll be right in the parking lot of the bank. And they'll say, they'll pop your tire on your car on the passenger side. So you'll put your bag down real quick, they'll come out, Man, sir, your, your tire's flat. Can we help you? Why are they distracting you on the other side of the car or someone else in your passenger side, the back seat, taking your thing? The guy will walk off. Oh, we'll get a spare tire or I have a, an air pump for you. And they're gone. These are the different crime, uh, crime trends that are happening. Jewelry stores, um, iPhone, Apple stores in the mall are getting crushed by this. People that go in, they'll buy new iPhones. Or go to a jewelry store, come out, you know, and they'll do the same thing. They'll wait till you get in your car, they'll follow you home, stuff like that. 
this is a, a it's not a new trend, but it's definitely happening more and more, and they're targeting you know, the people that are messing up. If you have, a, uh, if you get money out of the bank, right, they go directly home with it, do what you gotta do with it, don't drive around with it. Put it in the trunk, secure it. Do not leave it in your handbag, on the front seat, run it to Starbucks, go get your latte, because it's gonna be gone. Tell me right now, it's gonna be gone. Uh, gyms, also getting crushed. To have parking lots in the morning. Okay, these criminals know in the morning people just want to get their workout out, right? And they don't care about anything else. They want to go play, you know, pickleball or whatever. They leave their stuff in the car, it's plain view, they'll just smash the window and go. You're seeing that in Thompson Park. Um, people go for a walk, um, leave your purse, your wallet in the car, right there. Bang, they'll punch out your window, take your stuff, they go directly to a bank and they'll start taking money out. Um, it happens all the time, all over uh, the state. Um, today, actually, you know, quick little story, I can't get into too much, but I had mine, it was, we call it the Felony Lane Gang, uh, the original out of Florida. Uh, the Felony Lane is the last lane in a bank, right? The drive-thru. Back then, they didn't really have good cameras, so it was very hard for the banks to capture camera footage from there, so they called it the Felony Lane last lane in the drive through you know, you can see it in tell you. These people wear wigs, um, they'll, they'll hire uh, people from the streets, they'll pay them to give them drugs or money to go drive these cars and try to go to the drive throughs and take money out and do all this stuff with fake, you know, stolen checks, debit cards, stuff like that. I had one, it was January, it was the date. I had one in January, he had one in June. June. We actually today, like I said, sharing information is huge right now. Uh, Spotsville PD called us up. Hey, the uh, car got in a pursuit up in North Jersey. People bailed out. They got credit cards, IDs, locked up one female. That female is in charge of my job and his job. So we'll be signing the complaints on that. But that's what I'm saying. It, some things, it's not like TV. This isn't the first 48, this isn't CSI by any. These things take time. Um, it takes time to get records back on banks, these corporations, some of them are friendly, Silicon Valley sometimes doesn't really like us, um, Apple, Google, stuff like that, so we have to jump through hoops, get you know, search warrants signed by judges, and it takes months to get this information back sometimes, but like Dr. Bennett said, our foot is the pedal is down on the pool, we, we are out here trying, doing our best, and today was just a little thing, you know, from January, you know, it just came through, we person, and that's it. But that's how these crimes are solved. On the topic of distraction burglaries, Detective O'Ryan covered vehicle distractions, as far as home distractions. You're at your, you're at your house, a knock comes on the door, there's a man with a hard hat, a reflective vest, maybe he looks a little dirty like he's a, you know, a, a tree service. Today we're working in the yard next to you and we got to trim a tree and we would just like to talk to you for a moment because I think your tree hangs over the fence where we're working, and I just want to review something with you and make sure you're okay with this. Would you come around back and talk to us? And you go out the front door with this man, go around back, and he's talking to you about this tree, and then all of a sudden he's making a small talk about the weather. And in the meantime, two people go in the front door of your house, which is now left in a lot, go right to your bedroom, take your jewelry, whatever they can grab in the 30, 60 seconds, they're inside the house. They were gone, the tree service guy goes, okay, thank you for your time, man, have a great day. You don't discover this until later on when you go into the bedroom and now find things have been turned upside down. So that's one of the distractions as far as in-home burglaries, you know, be aware of. That does happen. Um, things to consider, did you make an appointment? Is this visit unannounced? Why is this person here? If you're going to go out and talk to them, lock your door. Let somebody inside the house know, hey, I'm going outside for a moment, just, uh, you know, keep an eye on things. I'll be right back. Don't everybody leave the house with this person and leave the house unattended. Just going around the side or the back of the house, you can only be 20 feet from the front door. If somebody sneaks in that quickly when you're not listening, if you're paying attention to what they're saying, and you miss it, and now all of a sudden you've got several thousand dollars worth of loss. So, guys, try to mention at home. What are the main things? If you have an alarm system, by all means, use it. How many burglaries we investigate and there's an alarm system and they're like, you know what, I never had it set. Or it has to work and I just never got it fixed. Now if you have it, use it. Please. 
It makes a difference. All right, again, it's not an animal deal. It is not going to stop your house from getting burglarized. But what it will do is give you the notification when you're at home asleep and somebody does trip one of those sensors. What do you hear? The thing will usually chirp to let you know that there's some sort of activation. That, or if you have it set to the siren, immediately goes off upon activation. That siren goes off, those people are out the door. Okay? They don't want to be there when this thing is screaming because now they know that somebody is aware of their existence within your house. Have these things set. Um, we've been to several businesses that have been burglarized within town. They never had the alarm set in any of these places. Had the alarms been set, we could have received notification possibly that could have led to an arrest. Understand one thing though. With your alarm system, that the activation, a lot of the times people have a delay. So when the alarm is now activated, there's a 30 to 60 second delay before the siren goes off. When that siren activates, or the silent alarm, some people have that, now goes to the alarm company. That takes several minutes for somebody in air to get that notification, and usually most residents have it set to call them first to confirm everything is okay in the house. So now the person at the alarm company is calling the residents when you're not home, and the phone's ringing, and the phone's ringing. Now they go to the second number. Oh, let me call that. Now you don't answer your cell phone because you're in the movie theater. Now they go to the third number. Well, how much time has transpired? A lot. Now when they finally go through those calls, they call the police. Well, it takes us seven minutes to get there sometimes, maybe more, depending on how tied up we are with other calls during the day, traffic, things like that. Maybe it's the middle of a bad storm, and we're out with flooding and road closures and other types of stuff or a bad accident. We can't get there that quickly. Now you're looking at 15 to 20 minutes that transpired from the time they got into your house. Okay? So again, that's what I'm telling you. It's not the end all be all. It's not going to protect you totally, but it will give one peace of mind to it gives these people uh, a reason to get the heck out of the house and all of a sudden they hear the, the alarm start going off. Uh, real quick on that, it's very important if you call your security company, um, <clears throat> see if there's an option where they don't call you first. Call the police first. Call 911 first. Um, and back to the total team effort mm -hmm. uh, thing, if you're, say, at playing cards at the clubhouse and the lady next to the alarm keeps going off, uh, it's okay. Be that person to say, no, it's not okay. Call the police. It's not okay. Because it's those instances right there, folks, that changes everything. It's that, eh, it's, it keeps going off, I don't know why. Or you just left the house a minute ago, okay, a minute ago, and it's going off. Yeah, there would be some burglary, the guy was gone for 30 seconds. I do a trap by it, one goes off. What does he do? Cancel. House burglary. Those are the little things that you get inundated with. Ah, it's going off again. It's this, it's that. Set them. If you have an audible one, or if you get one, audible is great. Make it loud. The burglars hate loud, they hate, they hate any attention to them. So that, 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 that's big. In all the arrests we've had of burglars, you want to know what the number one deterrent is for a burglar? Dog. I just hear you know, somebody say dog. It doesn't matter how big or how small that dog is, nobody wants to get bit. And dogs make noise, no matter how small they are, they scream. And anybody I spoke to that, had, that was involved in burglary said, I didn't go to that house because when I was about to go through the window, I heard the dog. Or I walked in the backyard and I saw that they had a dog. And based on what I saw sitting in the grass, they had a big dog. This dog. So I went to the next I did not see that, only because that's exactly what I was told. So, um, and keep your doors and windows locked. Um, lock your interior garage door. These are things like we just said earlier. Lock your sheds. Uh, utilize lighting, exterior and interior. When you leave, I know back in the day, you know, we're not wasting electricity, so let's turn off all the lights. We had a very prolific burglar here in Monroe back in 2005, 6, and 7. And this gentleman targeted homes along golf courses. And he, uh, what, probably three or four million dollars worth of theft committed over the course of four years between Monmouth, Middlesex, and Ocean Counties. And he would target gated communities that had golf courses within them. And he would sit on the golf course, and he was, it worked very well for him in the wintertime because the sun set so much earlier. So at 4.30, he would pick up a position in a, in a sand trap where he could get a, a view of a row of homes, and what happens at 5 o'clock, 5.30? Everybody starts going to dinner. Light out, light out, light out, light out, light out, light out. 
And now those were the five homes he'd go break into while they were out at dinner. And he'd smash your back slider in the wintertime. Your windows are closed, so you're not going to hear your neighbor's window shatter when he puts a, a hammer through it. So he didn't really have to worry about that all that much. People really burn out in the cold when they're walking their dogs and stuff like that. In the summertime, a little bit more. He wasn't as active in the summer because windows are open, people are out later. You know, but now in the wintertime, he sees those lights go out. Those were his homes for the night. And he chased this guy around for four years, when I was one of them, and through a combined effort with these three other counties, we ended up catching this gentleman, and he had every piece of jewelry in his house in Jackson Township that he had stolen from these three counties over the four years he had been doing this. So, the uh, lights are huge, TVs. You guys can actually measure them, it costs, I'm telling you, it costs pretty much nothing to keep that TV on. You know, the, the older generation, shut the lights off, mm -hmm. it's okay. Everything okay. Leave the lights on, make it seem like someone's home. Leave the volume on. You know, you're going out for a show, or you're going out to the city, wherever you might go, make it look like someone's home. Make it look like someone's home. You know, we, that, it's huge. We beat debrief burglars before, like you said. The home that looks like someone's home is the one you're going to go into. I mean, that's where I would go. You know, not the one with the TV on when I look at the master, or the upstairs lights on. You know, those are the things you have to do. Outside lighting is huge. Light it up. You can get outside lighting for free. Um, a lot of your communities now get comfortable with it. I know a lot of the newer developments, the uh, venue, a couple other ones, they all have to bring uh, doorbell things, uh, the cameras. They're good. They're good, but they're not that well be all, but set them up. We, we go around and we'll knock on doors and try to pull the security footage. I uh, never signed up for it. I uh, never did this. Um, if you guys are in a community and you had a board or, or something like that, I, I stressed this on the last one big time, is someone who's good with tech, right? Step up to the plate. Put out an email to the community. Say, hey, anyone need help setting up their ring or their security system? Be, be that neighbor. Be the good neighbor in the community and help each other out. Because some people really don't know the tech stuff. They don't know how to set it up. But that setting it up, and it might catch him just, he might feel like, oh, I'm good. Walk by, take his mask off, or whatever. And that could be the piece of the puzzle we need. So definitely uh, reach out to your guys' communities. Um, I know there's a couple out there that, that are coming up the venue. Anyone here from the venue? No? Venue? Gotcha. Did you come to the, to the one talk we had about a year ago? We were one Okay, yeah. So it's huge. It, it, it's a huge tool to, to do. Um, cameras outside, you can get them. Bring cameras. We have a, the new thing with the neighbors. We can send out a push notification to a certain area that has been targeted, and you can literally just forward it right to the police department. Um, we review it. It helps us from going door to door. We still go door to door. A lot of times when these burglaries are either it's really late at night and you want to disturb the people, or people are working during the day. Um, so we'll send out this notification. If we get nothing, we'll start again door to door just to get a timeline, even descriptions, stuff like that. The biggest tool, honestly, out of this whole checklist is see something, say something. If you see a car that's not in the neighborhood or not on the street, call. If you see people sitting in the cars, walking around, okay. The COVID is kind of, I think, over, right? There should not be a construction worker in a, in a traffic vest knocking on your door with a COVID mask on and a hard hat. That's a red flag. These are things they do. So you have that ring doorbell. You see a guy lingering around or he might come up, like Ben said, so you know, with flowers or something. That's not cool. Call. Just call us. We'll come out, check it out. It's huge because these crews. They might do it one day, and they might come back to your house a week later. They're just trying to see your pattern of life. All right, we did this three times. They must be working during the day. You know what I'm saying? So you guys have to, don't just dismiss it, you know? If you're at the, the card table, if someone's walking up my driveway, I didn't order anything, you know? It's weird. Is there a chance? Yeah, you might have went to the wrong house. 100%. But just call. That's what we're here for. You see a car sitting in the neighborhood, 
any time of the day, he's sitting in the same place, you see it driving, you know, from one end of the block to the other, or he's driving around really slow, anything like that, give us a call. We will come out and check it out. A lot of the times it may be like a private investigator or something, but once we confirm that, the person's allowed to be there, they can stay there. Um, if it's somebody who's not supposed to be there, they don't have a good reason for being there, well, now they're on our radar, and if something pops up, now we know who we should go after because we were alerted to the fact that you saw them there. And now we're aware that they're there. And that usually gets these people out of the neighborhood as well. So don't, don't hesitate to give us a call. And, and I, mean, I can't get into it much, but we had in the community last week, over the weekend. We had a burglary occurred there. Okay. Later that evening, they came back. Who called the police? Community member. Who got arrested? The burglar. It's you guys. Total team effort. I know Pete. I'm going to keep saying that, but if that person didn't call, it would have been another victim. And the original victim would have never gotten their stuff back. You got it. And the person arrested it committed the first burglary as well. So it wasn't same first, person. The first, the same person on the back. You got greedy. You know? And we tell everybody keep your valuables out of sight. That goes for car and house. You know, like, listen, we don't like to decorate our houses the way we want to decorate it. Don't leave your pocketbook sitting on the kitchen table when you have one of those breakfast milks and it's surrounded by windows and you've got a checkbook and you've got a pile of cash and you have iPads and things like that sitting around. Don't leave stuff like that in your car. Uh, we tell everybody the same thing with prescription medication. Don't leave that around in your car. We actually have cars that are getting broken into and they're stealing. Maybe you have uh, some type of painkiller, doxies or Percocets. Those are still desirable amongst people with addictions. So if they see that orange bottle sitting in your cup holder in Thompson Park, they'll take the risk and smash out the window to take that pill bottle and put uh, so it's like blood pressure medication. And then they'll go to the bottom. But now that you got a window over there. Okay? But because you left something there that drew their attention, that's the reason why they took the risk. Okay? So things like that. Don't leave stuff like that laying around in uh, wide open places. And just to finish, this is the uh, safe. Buy safe. I would say, don't put it in the master bedroom. Do not put it in the master bedroom. Master bedroom, 96% or more, I would say, that's exactly where they go, is the master bedroom. No one is going to the living room or the TV room. Okay? When they get into a house, they go right to the master bedroom. What's in the master bedroom? The jewelry box, the safe, right? It's probably not molded to the floor. Um, your money, if it's in a pillowcase, You'd be surprised when people still hide their stuff from the pillows and stuff like that. So lock it up, get a good safe. Um, basements are great because they got to lock them up the stairs. Um, we've seen these burglar crews, they'll, they'll wheel out their safe. They'll, they'll bring a ham truck. Um, we've seen it. So hold them down. Hold them down, get them. In we the saw when they drove the SUV that they were using to commit the crime, backing up the front lawn of the victim's house, pulled right out five feet to the front door, they were in the house, and then 15 minutes later, the 300 pound safe came out the front door. Now this is in a regular residential neighborhood, we're watching a security camera video of this, and this becomes like baffled by the fact, and this is broad daylight, this isn't even nighttime. And there's people walking on the sidewalk with their dogs, and there's kids getting off the bus, and all this stuff going on, and now maybe the neighbors just thought, oh, they're moving, this is where people move in, I don't, I don't know. When we came to neighborhoods after a burglary, we talked to the victims. We go now around and talk to the neighbors. Did you happen to see anything? Did anything weird happen tonight? And how many times a neighbor will say, you know, what's the name of that guy next door? What's the, the husband and wife? What are their names? And I'm like, oh, are you new to the neighborhood? They're like, no, I've lived here eight years. I've just never spoken to them. <laughs> and they don't know who these people are that live next door. Don't make that mistake. Okay, because the more eyes that are out there, the easier it is to combat this. And when you have somebody else looking around your neighborhood, it, it, it helps protect everybody. But when we have people that live next door and, and, and the sense of uh, being a neighbor has disappeared and, and nobody is looking out for each other, that's how these things continue to just, you know, happen. Um, one of the free services we do offer is uh, you can advise us of a vacation notice. I'm going to show that the next slide will have this. You can call our dispatcher, you can go on to our police department website, and you can register your address when you go away on vacation. And this is very helpful because our patrol officers get this on a daily basis and throughout the course of their, their shift, they'll go to your house 
and check on your house while you're away. Please list if you're going to have somebody that's going to come and water the plants or take care of animals or something like that. So in the office, you're there walking around the house and come across somebody in the living room. And you see through the window, oh, yeah, so the, the notice would show, okay, somebody is going to be there between 4 and 7 to take care of the plants. So, but again, we'll check. The officers on midnight shift will come by, they'll check the handles of the doors, make sure everything's secure, check the garage doors. If there's supposed to be vehicles there, it gives you a spot to list that. Again, let us know that the vehicle is supposed to be there. So when we show up and there's two cars in the driveway, we're like, wait, the, the notice said nobody's supposed to be here. And now there's two vehicles. The officer will look into that and find out why those vehicles are there. Maybe, you know, who knows? But again, it gives you a lot of room to, to list some different things as well as contact information. So in case something does turn up, we have somebody we can reach out to. Yes, make sure, this is a big one. If you go out of the country, do not give us your phone number. Okay. It's very hard to contact you if you're out of the country. Give us someone, either a neighbor, family friend, or family itself. Um, the other big thing, too, don't post on Facebook. Hey, I'm going to be gone for a month. <laughs> <laughs> you're laughing. These criminals are on Facebook. And they look like regular people. They're on the internet. The internet is unsecured. You can be as private as you want, and security, all this stuff on the internet. But they're there. They are there, and it's it, it's it's unpoliced, right? You can't police the internet at the time. And they're out there watching. Um, we had a couple cases, it, it, it makes me sick to even say it. Uh, funerals, wakes, residents that passed. Family members go to the wake, they come back, house of burglars. Happens. These guys do not care about anyone's feelings. All they want is your goods. That's what they're looking at. They're on the internet, they're in the obituaries, they're in the newspapers, and, and they're looking for victims. Um, happens. So you have to protect yourself, look after each other, and, and be a community. That's what it's really all about. You know, we covered the first two parts of this earlier, the third part, the social media. Again, that, that's, that's huge. You know, I, I, I tell my wife all the time when we go out, listen, I know we're going to take a bunch of great pictures and we're going to be doing fun things. Don't post a lick of it until we get home. And you, can, you can do a photo dump of 100 pictures after that, I don't care. Because we're home. But when people know you're on the way, you just told all your friends and your friends' friends. And just like you said, this day and age technology, it's, it makes it so much easier to find out where people are, where they live, and things like that. So when they see a name on Facebook, and they go through your preferences or your check-ins and they see, okay, Mary Smith, she seems to be doing a lot of stuff in Monroe. And so now they search Mary Smith Monroe Township and then they come up with an address online. They may find a phone number. They may find some other things because a lot of this tax information. You go to a municipal site and your tax information will reveal everything about you as far as your address and who to register and owner your home is on the deed. And they'll use that through the Facebook to be able to find where somebody actually exists. So when you're posting those pictures in Europe, as you're cruising down the Danube, <laughs> and this guy sees that, he finds that he does his research, he finds that he lives in, you live in one row, he goes to the house, and he's got carte blanche to run through your house now. We've got to do this. We've got to do this. The lighting, stuff like that. Uh, we talked about making your home look electrified. LED lights don't use any electricity compared to regular filament bulbs. If you have them in the house, leave them on. Put lights on timers, things like that, where they turn on and off. I got this one timer with a, with a 24 hour dial on it, and I can push things in and out. The light would go on for a half hour, turn off for an hour, turn back on for two. I, I make it look like a disco in my house every 15 minutes with the lights going on and off, if that's what you want. But if somebody's watching your house, they're going to see that and they're going to think, well, they're, they're, they're home, they're going to move on. Okay, so you want to try to make it, you know, look like somebody is actually there. Um, if you are going to invest in cameras, don't put them uh, all the way in outer space and face them down. Um, so all these people do is wear baseball caps. There's no good at sitting on top of a, a Yankees hat when they're on the doorstep. Um, put them high level. You know, make them have to go like this. So when they go like this, sometimes tattoos come out. You get to see identifiers, um, things like that. Um, those are little trends. People put these cameras up. Uh, if 
you, if you own a warehouse or you're at the mall, maybe something different, you want a bigger view, but if you're just trying to get your front door, don't, don't put it up facing the street. Yeah. <laughs> you know, when you go away and you leave your vehicle in the driveway, officers told me, make it look like I'm home. So I'm going to leave my car right there in the middle of the driveway. Well, that's great. Until the burglar looks into the car and he sees up on your visor, here's the garage door opener, that's the visor. Bust your window, hits the garage door opener, door goes up, wham oh, he's in the house. It's very common right now. It's very common back in the music. Uh, they'll look inside your, your windows in your garage, they'll see the Corvette inside, they'll see the Toyota Corolla outside, and they'll see the garage door, break the window, open it, click it, and we'll get the Corvette or whatever high-end vehicles inside. These are just little things, folks. They're very little things that you can do, right? Take the garage door clicker, keep it in your purse with you, right? Most cars now, I think they can program them right to your thing. It's, it's very simple. You know, the point in a lot of this is understanding that a determined burglar will find a way to get into anything he wants to get into. Okay, your job and our job is to try to make it as difficult as possible to make you want to move on to something else. But again, you can put up all the cameras you want, you can add all the motion lights you want, you can do everything like that. You can put the bar in the slider door, you can put chain link fence around your windows. They will find a way to get in if they are that determined, if they have a, a, a real reason to want to get there. So again, we're, we're not going to be able to make it impregnable, but we're going to make it difficult. That's really what, you know, our intention is in all this. I'm not just going to cover it now. I don't know what slide it's on. But cleaning ladies, right? Home health aids. Lock your stuff up, right? Don't leave your diamond necklaces, uh, all your, your gizmos, your gadgets out, OK? You're, you've seen a trend that slowed down a little bit with the cleaning services. Don't pull, pull, pull stay. They might not take it all because they don't want to make it noticeable, but you leave you know, 100 bucks out, there's a stack of it somewhere in the closet, and they're cleaning or putting their laundry away. They might only take 100. Okay, I got 100 this week, 100 next week. You might not even know if it's an envelope you keep in your closet for emergency money or whatnot. Uh, home health aids. Uh, we've seen that happen. People that are really you know, older and not doing well, ill. If you got a family that's not doing well, Take the valuables that you have the house. Put them in a safety deposit box somewhere. Put them in a safe somewhere. Don't just leave them out. Or if, if you know, I know a lot of people like wearing the jewelry and stuff like that. Maybe only leave a few pieces up of where they have them. They'll know if it's gone. Not the whole jewelry box where they won't see one item gone and stuff like that. You know, if you're the victim of a burglary, this includes car and house, um, probably is taking a wallet or something like that. We're going to ask them right off the bat what was, what was taken. And sometimes people are so worked up in this because of the stress and the anxiety that, that, that comes with this. I, I can't remember. I can't choose. I, I, think, I, I think my license was in there. Okay, what credit cards? Oh my gosh, I don't remember. Have these things listed somewhere. Put them away someplace so that in case this ever does happen, you have a list of your five credit cards. Call Amex, call Visa, call MasterCard, call Discover. Cancel my accounts, my stuff's been stolen. Don't give them an opportunity to use it and then find out it's been used. So what do you use your credit card? It's not the end of the world because you're protected. All right? The credit card will say, no big deal. We confirmed you did not make the charge. You're not responsible for it. We'll send you a new card. It's just an extra step you've got to go through. We tell people all the time, though, don't link your debit cards to things. Okay? Because if you lose, if your debit card is compromised, that gives them direct access to your bank account. And a lot of times, debit cards are connected to savings accounts. So we're going to have the majority of our money in a savings account. So on a credit card, they can only get $20,000 line of credit that belongs to Discover. You won't be on the hook for that. But when they take $20,000 out of your savings account through your debit card, that is going to be harder to recoup because a lot of the times the banks have different rules than the credit card companies. So just keep that in mind. And put the alerts on your phone. Uh, most people have a smartphone now. Put the alerts on. If you need help, ask, ask someone in the community. But the alert, say fraudulent or these smartphones are very smart, they, they track you, so they know where a weird purchase might come. If you've never been to North Jersey before, okay, mm -hmm. and they had a wild out there, it, it might flag you. You can put it, you 
know, as a flight, pull out your credit card, and they'll send you an alert. And these phones track you, they know where you're spending your money and all that stuff. So it will come up as an alert. If you start getting alerts from Florida, okay, you, you've been compromised. You haven't been to Florida in 20 years. Um, something's up. In, in the realm of fraud and theft like that, having your credit card used is probably the best thing. Yeah. Because again, you didn't, you didn't lose anything. All right, you didn't lose anything. You're just going to get a new credit card at some point in time, which is no big deal. So don't don't be upset over that. Oh my gosh, somebody used my card somewhere. That's that's no problem whatsoever. And of all the things that happened, that's what I I did for me. What's it happen today? I don't care. 9 p.m. routine. You know, we try to encourage the state to start doing this. We're trying to encourage people at 9 o'clock or at some point during the evening before you settle in for bed and stuff. Go through, make sure your valuables are put away. Lock your doors, make sure your car is locked, make sure your keys aren't in the car, your windows are up, things like that. If you're going to sleep with your window open, that's fine. But if not, the windows are closed, lock them so you don't give somebody the opportunity to get in the house. You just try to get into this type of routine. Don't be the person that leaves the newspapers laying all around in the driveway because that makes it look like you haven't been home. That makes your house a little bit more attractive because all their mailbox is overflowing and the newspapers are there. I'll take a shot on this one. It doesn't look like they've been there. They're going to vacation. So, uh, we have a voluntary security camera registry, which all this is is that when we have an incident in a particular area, we can go to this site and we can see who's registered their security cameras. So instead of us driving around the neighborhood looking for, for cameras, we can see who's registered and who's willing to, to share this information with us. It's, it makes it a little bit easier for us to track down so we don't have to keep knocking on doors. door. It doesn't give us access. No, no access. It just gives us an address. Okay, they have cameras. They don't. Um, the other thing with the ring, neighbors, we can push it out. If you have a ring, you don't need a ring camera to be on the ring neighbors. Um, Download the ring app, and if there's an incident in the area, if you want to kind of know what's going on, or you might have information, um, then we'll, we'll spit it out. Uh, technical, Brian just covered this about thefts in the home, such as home health aids and things like that. Uh, caregivers. So now we're done with that, we're going to roll in the scams. So this is one, one thing uh, that I forgot to mention, it's very important. I think so. It helps us make you have a home health aid with a family member or a cleaning service. Maybe it's a new one. Whoever's doing even construction, whatever it might be. If they're going to be at your house a couple of times, take the license plate down. Take a picture of the car. You're allowed to. If there's no, you might come into nothing, but at least you have it. God forbid something happens, you have that in the back pocket. It's a huge lead for us to get the ground rolling. We don't have to start pulling camera footage, license plate readers, this, that. You already have it. It's just a little tool. Hey, I'm going to have construction at my house for a month. Take a picture of the license. That's it. Very now, don't give these people free reign in your house either. Yeah. Uh, yeah, an exterminator that comes and this person coupling walks around and he'll go room to room and spray the baseboards and stuff. Well, yeah, he goes in the two rooms, he'll be in there for 15 seconds. Also, it takes a second to walk past the dresser and grab something put it in your pocket. All right? You can't be all that trusting of all these people that are coming into your house. Somebody's there to repair the cable, somebody's there to work on an air conditioner. There's nothing the matter with being in the room or being in the hallway to see your, I mean, yeah, you're in the room and don't be hanging over your shoulder or the guy's like, listen, I'm not working here because you're hanging on like a, you know, a vulture. But, you know, you can be there and watch what they're doing. This is your house. You need to protect it. And you can't be that trusting of everybody that comes in because you don't know who these companies are employing. And, there's so, and a lot of your times these companies don't know who they're employing. Because background checks have gone, you know, the way of the dinosaur now. Companies, companies are so desperate for workers, they're willing to take any warm body that wants a job. And I'm being honest when I say that. There used to be a lot more research done into this when you would hire somebody. Now they, these places can't get employees. They can't get good employees. But I've got two people that are willing to go through these service calls for me, and he shows up one time, what am I going to do? Go ahead now, Johnny. And Johnny turns out he's lost four jobs because he's stolen from everyone he's worked before. This guy never did his homework. Hires the thief, and that thief is in your house. All right? So again, just it comes down to you doing your homework, you doing a little bit of research, and you hire people. You tell everybody all the time, don't hire people off of Craigslist. Okay? Facebook Marketplace is another place to be very near you. You don't know who you're getting. People could be posing to somebody else. So again, just do your homework before you have people come into your house. So that really gets into identity theft and this type of fraud. 
Uh, the U.S. Department <coughs> defines identity theft and identity fraud as terms used to refer to all types of crime in which someone lawfully obtains and uses another person's personal data in some way that involves fraud or deception, typically for economic gain. Their sole purpose in this is to make money. Whether it's your money or somebody else's money, they want cash. And that's how they're going to get it. So when they use your credit card, that's not necessarily the identity theft. All right, but now when they apply for a loan in your name, now that's the identity theft. That's where we fall into that. When they start making IDs and they're going to the bank to cash a check, and the, the ID has their photo but your personal information, that is identity theft. Okay, so we're dealing with that a lot where these uh, bank transactions are taking place with stolen checks, washed checks, you hear about that, where a thief will get a check, they clear it out, and then they reprint the new image and stuff, a new bank account number on it, and they use your information to cash the checks. So there's, there's various methods for this to, to occur. Uh, a lot of these things operate internationally. This makes it very easy for them to succeed and harder for us to catch them. Uh, they use leading questions and use wording to gain trust. And so a lot of the stuff we're referring to now is going to occur usually on the telephone, uh, maybe through uh, communication and emails and stuff like that, but mostly telephone. Um, most also use mass IP addresses or big telephone numbers. Never trust the number you get on your call or ID. We've had scams where people have shown up, they showed up on the call or ID, one of police, and they had our phone number, and it was not us. Uh, my father's got that where it said U.S. Treasury. You know, so when you look at it, you're like, wow, Washington, D.C. is going. You know, so you answer the phone, and it's like, yeah, you haven't paid your taxes in four years. We're coming to arrest you. Now listen, in 20 years of police work, a lot has changed. The one part that hasn't changed is that we do not notify you when we're coming to get you. <laughs> <laughs> we still have the element of surprise, and we still enjoy the use the element of surprise. And we use that to our benefit all the time. So when somebody tells you on the phone, you're going to get locked up. We have officers sitting down the street. You're going to be arrested if you don't. It's all a scare tactic. And right off the back, you can hang on the phone. All right? Because that's just nothing but baloney. We're not going to tell you when we're coming to get you. <laughs> this, this, this topic here with the scams, it's, uh, it's pretty wild. Because I'm telling you right now, I bet you there's a victim in this room that's been scammed or lost their identity. Um, and sometimes it destroys people. The whole life savings, 401ks, got it. There's no coming back. Zero. This here, the, the scam part, is a huge, huge part of working together. And we'll get into it. Your friend says, hey, i got to go to the bank. My son's going to get arrested. There's hundreds of stories these people make up. Tell them, relax, let's call the police. 911 or a non emergency number. Gift cards. Okay? There's this whole PowerPoint I'm going to tell you the person here. Gift cards are not used to pay any, anything. Do not ever buy a gift card for a payment. Okay? If you're buying a gift card for your grandchild or for a birthday party, that's fine. You should never be buying gift cards, scratching off the back of a number, and giving it to someone. Okay, that, that is one of the biggest scams going out there. These retailers do not care. Okay? They'll sit there, the 18-year-old on the counter, someone will come up, well, I want to buy $700 worth of Amazon gift cards. And there's a little prompt on the screen, and it says it's a small fine. Are you being frauded? Are you being this? And these people are very good and manipulate you, and they will tell you do not trust anyone, do not call the police, and you'll hit OK, and the sale will happen. Okay? Banks. It drives me nuts. People will come in and say, I want to wire $100,000 to Hong Kong, okay, or India, or wherever it might be, okay? And these banks allow it. They allow it, folks. They'll ask you two or three times, they'll have you sign something, but what are these people on the phone saying? Don't trust the bank. They're the ones who are compromising your account. They're the ones doing this. We're the secret police. We're the secret TV bank investigators. We can't let the bank know we're investigating them, but they got your account. So you can't tell them. You can't 
can't call the police. And you hit the green button, and there goes your 401k, 300, we have one for almost a million dollars. We had several for close sale, we had one for 1.2. And there's no coming back. We have no jurisdiction internationally. Um, to not get your money back. And it goes from account to account to account within hours. In the dark web. And then it's gone. It is a real thing. It happens every day. And it happens in this community. And I'm sure some people here it's happened to, or their neighbors, or someone in their community it's happened to. And it's real. So this is an interesting statistic here. It says, who's impacted the most by this? So this is, again, based on 2019 statistics, which is the most recent that we can get a hold of. And the highest number there is people between the ages of 60 to 69. Approximately, on a side note, approximately 51% of unreported attention is over the age of 55. And I saw an interesting thing on the news the other day. It said that 90% of the world's wealth is possessed by people over the age of, I think, 60 years old. Right? Which is an amazing number. 90% of the world's wealth is possessed by those 60 and older. So that makes you attractive targets. You're not going after 22 year old kids, you're not going after 30 year old people because they don't have the wealth accumulated that you may have. All right? And God bless you if you're able to enjoy your life and be retired and, and everything you work for in your life, you, you still have. And you're able to live comfortably. Good for you. But you are now the target for them. And these are going to be, you know, people are going to be going after you for this reason. So I, this statistic is very um, interesting for that fact. So a majority of the reports and the contact method, like I said before, is going to be phone call. Um, it's going to start either through cell phone or your house line, and it's just going to be out of the blue. Uh, we do still get some mail ones where somebody will get a sweepstakes uh, notification in the mail and they respond that way, and then there's a phone number that they reach out to, um, and they kick off uh, the scam that way. You, you're actually reaching out to them now, um, you know, by initiating the call to the phone number. Another one is on the internet. You're on your computer, and all of a sudden a little window pops up that says, your computer might be compromised, call Microsoft with this 1866 number, and now you're calling the scammer directly. And this guy's going to make it seem like he's a repairman, he's going to help you out, and then there's some type of money just swindled somehow or another, or you're giving them remote access to your computer, and they are now siphoning all this information off because they direct you to a site where they all of a sudden the mouse starts moving around, the windows are opening and closing, and they're explaining to you, sir, we're surfing all over, oh, yeah, we found the virus, we're taking it off, we're going to take care of this for you, oh, you're the we're setting you up with all this protection. Things are opening and closing, and they tell you, listen, don't turn off your computer, we're going to work on this for the next day or two. And people told us, you're looking at the computer the following morning, things are still all around us, so, so this person is searching all these files on your computer to find out where you do your online banking, what are your account numbers, what are your credit card numbers, your Google accounts, your Amazon accounts, all of this stuff. And now you compromise your email and all this other stuff. That is one of the most damaging things you can do is getting somebody else from access to your computer. It opens you up to a world of hurt. Not do that. I, I can guarantee you when you log into Google, you go to TV Bank, whatever your banking is, your password and username is probably saved, right? No one likes doing the whole password. It automatically goes in, right? Once you, they send you that link, Computerfixers.com, we got you. We'll send you a link. Now they control the mouse. Where do they go? We'll hit all the top five banks, and whatever one comes up with your username and your thing there, boom, they click it, they got your route number, they got everything. It happens in seconds, folks. And unplugging your computer, sometimes it's too late. Stay off the phone with these people. Okay, the IRS, the police department, any of these corporations, they're not calling you for, for gift cards or money, okay? There's zero bail in, in New Jersey and New York. Zero. No one, there's no more. There's no more bail money. doesn't happen. Okay? They're, they're not calling for gift cards. Okay? So this, this chart here, I think, is in, in the last five years, or four years, it's probably safe to say that some of these bars have changed a little bit. I think wire transfer has decreased dramatically. I'm not, I'm not seeing that number of reports anymore like we used to. Everybody used to get told to go to Western Union, 
go to CVS or go to uh, Stop and Shop, and that's how you're going to transfer the money. Uh, so much of it now is gift cards, um, payment services where you're wiring the money electronically, Zelle, uh, Venmo, things like that, where you are you know, connecting directly digitally. You're not actually handling the funds. You're sending it electronically through the internet. And that makes it harder for us to be able to track, trace, and find out where it went. Bitcoin, another one. Cryptocurrency, I'm glad you brought that up. I was actually just thinking that, but I forgot it. Cryptocurrency is, it's, it's remarkable now how people, listen, I'm not going to criticize you when you put your cash. All right, but when you're investing in things that don't physically exist, and they don't exist in this country, they exist elsewhere, China. How many reports we take from people that put twenty, thirty, fifty thousand dollars into some type of cryptocurrency account, and now they can't get a hold of this money? Or in the springtime, we just had a major crash of this type of market, and there are people that the money's gone; it doesn't exist anymore. It, it, you know, and there's no way, there's no recourse to get it back. At least with a bank, your money is insured to an extent. Okay, but cryptocurrency, there's no way to get that back, and so much of this exists outside the country. So we even have an officer at our place that invests in cryptocurrency, and his money is sitting someplace. He has no way to retrieve it, and this has been going on for a year now, where it says I have this money, and it's sitting someplace, but I can't withdraw it. won't let me withdraw it. His bank won't allow him to take it back because it's coming from China. It's crazy. It really is. So, frauds have obviously become very lucrative to these people. When we're talking about phone scams, if they call 100 people a day, and they get two that fall for their script, it becomes lucrative because now they're making thousands of dollars for each victim. So all I need is two or three people answer the phone a day, I'm a rich man. So these are some of the different types of scams. You got the IRS scam. That's what they tell you usually in the springtime. Hey, we were doing an audit of your account, we found that 2019 you failed to pay. $3,000 in tax. You've got to pay that up now, otherwise we're taking away your social security. We're going to cop you come to your house, we're down the street waiting for you, we're going to print up a warrant for your address. All these threats. Um, don't fall for them. IRS is not going to call you. <laughs> right? Lottery sweepstakes scam. That used to be a very popular one. We used to have the um, Jamaican lottery was where it all started. And uh, the publisher's clearinghouse is another one. People will be said, I had a woman in Ross store. Got a notification in the mail, congratulations, you won the Buick Lacrosse. Call this number. And she calls the number, okay man, congratulations, it's the end, you're lucky day, and this and You need to pay the taxes. Alright, so it's only a couple thousand dollars, and we can work all this out, then we'll deliver the car. So she called up about five thousand dollars, and then the following day, oh well, there's also something else, and there's something else, and there's something else. And this woman, by the time thirty some thousand dollars was turned over, I said, "We well, already bought half the car." <laughs> you know, and that's when her daughter was like, she, the daughter noticed that money was being withdrawn from an account, and because of the daughter being tied into this account, that's how she was aware of it. Otherwise, if if uh, the victim had been the sole account holder, the daughter never would have found this out. Um, romance scams, that one's not so common around here. But it's where you become uh, you become friendly with somebody online and you meet with chat. And these people will spend months to years cultivating this relationship with you, talking to you about whatever it is they do. They're usually in the military, they're overseas someplace, and, and they can't wait till they're discharged. They can come to New Jersey and meet you, and I'm coming right. You're going to be at the North Airport, right? Because I can't wait to meet you, and all of a sudden something terrible happens. I'm stuck in the brig, I got locked up in Syria, I'm a military a doctor, and I, I'm caught over here. Can you? Can you Send money over so I can get out of here. This is terrible. Oh my God. And because you've developed a relationship with this person online over the last nine or ten months, you are now inclined, you feel you are, to send money. And now you wire money someplace, and it just continues to be a cash cow for these people who are now they keep praying on your sympathy in order to keep sucking more and more funds from you. Uh, vacation scams. Listen, if they call up and say, Congratulations, you just want a timeshare or some type of vacation down in the Bahamas. We need you to pay five thousand dollars in order to win, you know, to complete this transaction. No. Um, uh, I don't know. What we're seeing now, it's at the bottom. <coughs> ATM skimmers. This is a big one. Um, this is organized crime groups that are doing this. 
Um, we'll put a skimmer at a bank or 7-Eleven or any CVS, anywhere where there's ATMs. Uh, we'll put your card in, we'll take all the information off it, we'll retrieve it, they'll make new debit cards, and new cards, we'll have all the information. So, a couple tips as in the field. A, use a, a bank. Banks, you're supposed to check them twice a day. They'll pull on them, check the machines, the high-tech machines now, they catch it pretty good. Um, don't use ATMs if you don't have to in corner stores or other places that maybe aren't checking them as fluently. Um, you'll, you'll, you'll become a victim. This is rising all throughout the state, these ATM skimmers. It's big. Um, so just, you can pull on it sometimes. Sometimes they'll pull right off, like the cases. Um, they're really good at the 7-Eleven ones. They have a certain type of AT um, like pin when you go to 7-Eleven if you've been recently. And they duplicated this perfectly. Um, we're seeing a big thing in that. And it looks so. So just like pull on it, it'll fall right off. But people don't check it. Um, so definitely be careful. The FBI lock screen, um, as well as computer repair scan. That's, that's one, just uh, last week I had a woman she was on her computer all of a sudden and a window popped up that alerted her to the fact that her computer has been used for nefarious purposes. And to call this number that this is a federal government, please reach out to this phone number. So she calls the phone number, not knowing what this is about. Now mind you, she's about 82 years old. And calls this number and they say, well, ma'am, we've detected that your computer has been used to watch child pornography. Mm -hmm. And right now, they're putting together an arrest warrant for you because obviously what you've done is illegal. This one goes, I've never done that. And they're like, oh, oh, so we're mistaken. And she goes, yeah, that's not me. I never, I, this computer is only used by me to look at flowers and, and do stuff in my pictures. And he goes, okay, well, that's great. I was hoping you'd say that because we want to help clear your name. So there's some research we have to do, but it's going to cost something to help clear your name. But well, once we confirm it's not you, we'll refund you the money. So she was directed to go buy gift cards. So she ran out with all these gift cards, but she's very proud to tell me that I never gave them the gift cards. I have bags of the gift cards, $40,000 worth of gift cards. And two shopping bags are standing in our police department. And I start pulling the gift cards out, and I'm like, yeah, we bought the gift cards. What did you do? She goes, well, they wanted verification that I purchased them. So I gave them the number on the back of the card. <laughs> That bag of gift cards can go right in the garbage because there isn't a penny left on a single one of those cards. Once you give that number on the card, you've sacrificed and you've compromised the card. You've given everything that you've given them access to the card is what you've done. And they can now electronically withdraw the money from that card and put it wherever they're going to keep it. So keep that in mind. Again, these are all different little ways they're going to try to convince you to trick you and, 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 and make you do things. And, and this woman. You know, just wanted to clear her name is all she wanted to do. So can you hear me now, Skip? It's something that started a couple of years ago during COVID where people were getting phone calls and you would answer the phone and there would be some sort of distorted, mumbled, you know, mess on the other side. Hello? Hello? And then somebody would say, can you hear me now? And you would go, yes. And they would record your voice saying yes. And this way they would now contact the bank and try to do things with your account, and when, to try to convince the teller at the bank or the person on the phone that this is you, they would use your voice recording, answering, yes. Then the teller would say, do you really want to transfer $15,000? And they'd play, yes, yes. And it's like, it sounded like you. And like, I mean, I don't really know how much that really folded into crime, but it was something that we were starting to see. Um, after COVID, it sort of like started to disappear again. Uh, any phone call you get, and I know people will say, they Google. They'll know your, your, your grandson's name. They'll know your husband's name. They'll know your birthday. They'll know a couple numbers of your social security <clears throat> number. They'll know these things. So when the IRS calls and they know your birthday, and they know a couple numbers of your social, don't be surprised. That's how they get you in that, in that mindset. Like, oh, is this real? How do they know Johnny's name? How do they know my grandson's birthday? How do they know this? How do they know where I live? How do they know where my daughter lives? California. It's the internet, so they do their homework. They're very good at it. And they'll make you think that it's real. That's their job. They'll call you a hundred times. You hang up before you're back. Why do you hang up? 
Little Susie's here. I have her. She's in jail. Why are you doing that? That's not too Oh, her birthday is next week. She doesn't want to be in jail next week. Come bail her out. These are the things they do. It's all mental. And they'll snag you. If you die quick enough, the hang that phone up, and call someone out, they're going to get scammed. Call the police. By a show of hands, has anybody gotten this phone call? Her grandparent? Okay. One of the things with this, and everybody that I've gone to work, we, we sit down, we talk about it after it's happened. When you answer the phone, hello, Grandma, Grandma, and you go, Jimmy, you give him the name. You give him the name because people are like, on the phone, they knew my parents' name. And sometimes they may, most of the time they won't. But you give the name because you're like, Jimmy, it doesn't sound like you. And you're like, Grandma, because my nose is broken, I got the car accident. They play it all off like that. These are scripts. They rehearse these scripts nonstop. And they're so good at these scripts that they have the voice inflection to make it sound like they're the lawyer, the, 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 the VA that's on the other line, the judge. The judge is never going to talk to you on the phone, right? The judge is not going to talk to us. He's not going to talk to you. So they put all these people on, and, and they must have a, a, a group of people that just sit there and wait. It's okay, John, your turn. Yeah. It's your part. Play the victim. And now he's going on, oh, yeah, this is the DA. We're going to have your grandkid up and stuff. Well, they should come up with the money and this and that. Then the doctor gets on the phone. Well, the person he ran over just died. Bail's going up, my friend. You know, but the, but the, the whole thing with this scam is urgency. Time is of the essence. If you don't respond now, your family member is going right for time and they're doomed. All right? Don't call anybody else in your, in your family. Don't notify anybody else. You do what we say. Don't disconnect this phone. Otherwise, you know, they're going to suffer some sort of terrible thing. That's what they do. And they, a lot of the times, they won't let you get off the phone. They'll go to the bank. They'll send you to the bank to get the money and keep you on the line and talk to you while you're going to the bank and keep you on the phone while you're at the bank. And while you're driving back from the bank, you're still on the phone. And then when you get home, they direct you on how we package the money for the person who's coming to pick it up. And we just had two cases where we made arrests on these because we thought, wow, we're getting the person coming to the house. The people called up, they realized it's a scam. I'm hiding in the bushes like a fool. I'm laying out there in the rain. And here comes this Chrysler minivan comes up. Guy gets out of the car, says, you have a package for me, man? I get out, wham, we lock this person up. He's an Uber driver. Yeah. The scammers are using Uber drivers to pick up the money now as the courier. So the person who showed up at the house had no clue what the heck was going on. He's screaming because he thinks he's getting attacked. <laughs> We're the police that are arresting him. And it turns out he had no true involvement in any of this other than the fact that he answered the Uber pickup. And Uber, oh, you're not supposed to be picking up packages. You're supposed to be picking up people. And they acknowledge this during the conversation when they accept the job. That you're not picking up a person, you're picking up a very important document that you need to deliver to this address. And the ones we had were bringing the, uh, the packages to Harlem, um, Queens, New York, places like that. So they were going to inner city spots where you know, we were never ever going to be able to retrieve this money. They use fake uh, spoofer numbers, they'll tip these drivers, they'll throw them, hey, if you get this package to me within an hour, I'll give you 200 bucks. It's very important. So, I mean, people will do it. No, it's not common. They don't know. IRS, we covered that a little bit. Same thing, it's, again, the IRS is not going to call you. They will send you some sort of document. Uh, but again, if the way to fix this problem is through gift cards or a money transfer or things like that, be done with it. IRS tax returns, sometimes you'll go to file your taxes in March and, the, and your accountant will tell you, You've already filed your taxes. No, I haven't. I'm doing it right now. No, somebody's already filed in your name. That's simply like an identity theft that situation takes a little bit to resolve. Um, we were seeing a lot of that during COVID. During COVID, when these criminals had a lot more time to sit around the house and pick up ideas, uh, they started going after tax returns. And just like, you know, especially today with COVID, refund payments have been very prevalent like then. Um, <clears throat> lottery and sweepstakes scams. Let's see, I. We'll go to this one. You've got to pay taxes and fees before you're able to collect your wings. The agent will request payment for the taxes and fees via all of these, you know, everything we've talked about. And listen, I know we've said this a dozen times. I mean, you're wrapped up in the moment. And I mean, we can sit here, we can laugh about it, chuckle about it, stuff like that. 
And it's so widespread, and it happens so much. On, on multiple times a day within this town, I can say within this town, not the state, within this town, multiple times a day. All right, because you get caught up in the moment, and you're believing the fact that you've, you're, you've got delusions of grandeur that I'm now inheriting, I'm getting this money, this is the windfall, it's finally my day. The sun is shining on me. And so this is it, you go for it. So this was the case that I had back in 2007, okay? This is a very sad story. This took place in Moscow. So a resident of Monroe was contacted via telephone by an individual in Jamaica who stated that she had won the lottery. Before victim one could collect her wages, she had to wire the individual money and cover the taxes. <clears throat> Over the course of the next few months, she wired a total of two hundred forty-eight thousand dollars to this individual. So, during this time period, she contacted the police department because she was concerned when the individual stated he was going to show up at her residence. He called her up and said, "Okay, you've satisfied all the payments you needed to make. You're going to get the millions of dollars. We're coming to your house, and it's going to be like publisher's clearinghouse. We're going to have a check." We're going to have the cameras, and we're going to have armed guards. And when she heard armed guards, she became very scared. Because she's like, why would they come? I've never seen a publisher's career. I said, you need an armed guard. It's only just people with the camera. And so she called us. And we went there, and we're like, oh my gosh, you've been involved in this scam. And she's like, oh, really? And we're like, yeah. So I get changed, and I start, I put on jeans and a t-shirt. I sit in this woman's house now pretending to be her grandson. We've got our SWAT team hidden throughout Moscow, waiting for these people to show up because they're apparently at North Airport coming through because they're on their way to her house. And so for four hours I sit in her house talking to her about all of this, and she's accepting the fact that, holy cow, I can't believe I've been scammed. All of these months that this has gone on, this whole thing was just a trick. So we're sitting there, we're sitting there, we're sitting there. I have lunch with her and everything. The SWAT members are sitting outside in the heat. I'm in the air conditioning at least. And I'm having lunch with her, and then the phone rings. And she answers the phone, and it's Patrick from Jamaica. And he goes, hey, we have a problem. Alan, and she's like, what? He goes, oh, you need to come up with another couple thousand dollars. They won't let us clear customs at the airport until you pay this. And she's like, oh, OK, Patrick, no problem. And I'm like, what are you doing? Get off the phone. So she gets off the phone. She now calls the bank. She calls um, the bank at the corner of Apple Garden and Lynch Drive. When she calls that bank, she's demanding money from her annuity. Her husband had passed away and left her money in the annuity. I went down the line in the kitchen listening in, and she's telling the bank that she has cancer and needs the money for treatments. And the bank said, you know, we can't give you this money in one sum. You have to get it in monthly installments. We just can't give you. But I'm dying. I need this money for cancer treatments. I got on the phone, and I said, Man, this is the police. And she goes, really? And I'm like, yes, this is the police. I'm at the house with dealers. She goes, I can't talk to you. And she had tough on me. Huh? So we ended up reaching out to her kids. She's got a daughter down in West Virginia. Obviously, there's a distance there. She's like, I can't get up there. I can't do anything about this right now. But my brother lives in Wayne, New Jersey. So we call the brother in Wayne. The brother's answer is, this is the reason why we put my mom in Roswell. So we didn't have to deal with these things. <laughs> so I said, you understand, this is your inheritance. This is your mom. And your mom is giving all your inheritance to some clown in Jamaica. I suggest, at your earliest convenience, you come here and do something about it because the bank won't even talk to me. All right? I'm powerless to do anything to stop this as much as I want. I can't. And he goes, well, I'll get to it when I can get to it. And that was how this ended at that point in time. So we immediately opened up an investigation, set up a sting operation. I just explained all of that. Um, we told her, avoid all future contacts with these people, hang up on them, don't talk to them again. Patrick being persistent, kept calling, kept calling, kept calling. Over the next six months, she gives another couple hundred thousand dollars to Patrick. So she realized that a life savings is dwindled. Sadly, she took her own life. So we get a call from, um, this is probably six months after our initial contact with her. We get a phone call from uh, a short community and said, We have a, a vehicle parked by the uh, jetty that comes back to a resident in your town. It's been here for about two or three days and it hasn't moved. We don't know why it's here. So I'm like, Who's the resident? They give me the name and I'm like, Boy, I remember that name. And I go to Osborne, they give me to go into her house. 
when I go into the house, all through Arabic, I should have every cabinet part. Give this to Goodwill, give this to the food pantry, give this to this place. Donate this here. She had her own obituary written out on the counter. She had the ledger that she kept track of all of this over the last year. Every single wire transfer that she made, the date she made it, the amount she said, and by the time she was done, it was a grand total of four hundred and like eighty thousand dollars that she had sent to this Patrick in Jamaica. All right. She realized that she was she had no more money. She had to pay her cable bill, her electric bill, her bill in like eight months, and she turned off all of those services before she did what she finally did. Um, I called the police department back down there at the shore, and I'm like, I got bad news. I got a feeling that something terrible has happened. And they eventually found her. She hurt herself in the jetty rocks. And that's where her daughter had spread her ashes. Her name spread her daughter's ashes when she died. So it was a significant place for her. Now, there is one little bit of light at the end of this you know, long story. This made national news when this had happened. Because this now somebody had finally, you know, not finally, but had lost the light because of this scam. Where every, every time before it's just been money. Now somebody died. This news came down, down to Jamaica, and the people knew who this Patrick in Jamaica was because he was living like a fat cat with all the money that the Americans were sending him to be scammed. The village that he lived in didn't like that this had happened. They went and lynched him and killed him. Wow. And that made national news a week after our movie made national news. So this guy they ended up taking his life because of the fact that the Jamaicans felt bad. He's making us look bad. This is the Jamaican lottery scam, quote unquote. So it was a very, it was a very sad ending to this type of story, but it shows you how deep this goes and how this can ruin somebody's life. And we sat in that house. I remember sitting there telling this woman, "God, stop! This, this is a scam." She's like, "I know, I know, I know." But as soon as she had the opportunity to get a full Patrick, okay, I'm going to get right to the bank as soon as I can. She, she still believed that this was going to happen. Don't send people money online. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Vacation scam, we talked about that. Home improvement scams. If you live within a gated community, you probably see this less because you just can't have solicitors come into your communities and do things like this. But if you live out in a regular neighborhood, you get a guy who comes to the house and says, Hey, I'm doing three blacktop jobs on driveways down the street. I'm willing to give you a discount as a fourth job if you're willing to, you want your driving flies up, I'll do it for half price. But I need like $1,000 up front to be able to go get the supplies. And you give him $1,000, the guy throws a can of Dutch Boy black paint in the driveway, and then leaves to go get more supplies, and never comes back again, and you're at $1,000. So, again, be careful. You know, we tell you, do your homework, make sure to hire licensed contractors, don't make large deposits. Again, because this is the opportunities for you to become compromised. And if you haven't made the appointment, it's probably not a good idea because it's, use people like you contact. If this guy shows up out of the blue and wants to offer you something, you know, we always say it's too good to be true, it probably is, right? Uh, mortgage and debt relief scams. Uh, the, the work with banks and lenders to significantly lower your payments. This involves you giving over all types of financial information to people that don't need your financial information. They're not there to help you. They're only going to use your information to, to liquidate your accounts. After you divulge your information, they'll either disappear or claim to be a deposit. This can cost you thousands of dollars and continue for extended periods of time. Charity scams, unfortunately, are a by trying this too. Whenever we have some type of natural disaster, everybody and his brother comes out looking for money, whether it's the Red Cross, and you may have a legitimate Red Cross person soliciting for money, but then there's also other, uh, other people that uh, go under the guise of the Red Cross or some other type of charitable organization. Uh, we get people all the time that say, well, the, the Monroe PBA or the state FOP called me and, and, and you know, I, made, I made a donation to you guys over the phone. We never solicit. Over the phone. We send out a mailer and a call. That's the only contact that we're ever going to send anything out. I constantly get a call for fallen officers of Florida. I don't know why Florida. <laughs> I don't think I'm interested in donating to that, but I get this call all the time. I'm never ever going to make a donation. They prey on your sympathy, they prey on your compassion. Okay? We all want to be good people. 
That's just our human nature. Again, do your research before you give any type of funds away to these places. You don't know where it's going. Uh, again, you hear the now scam we just talked about, uh, uh, discussed before. You know, we tell people all the time, look at what I use as a phone. All right, flip phone. I don't get in trouble with this. <laughs> all right? Smartphones are, are the devil's creation, I swear. <laughs> they, cause, they cause so many headaches. But, you know, through these phones and stuff, it, it's allowed people to contact you so much easier now, you can text messages. Um, I'll get notifications from T Bank that my bank account is compromised, call this number so we can clear out the scam. I don't have a dollar in a team bank, I've never dealt with a day in my life except I'm here at work. All right, all my money's in Bank of America, so when I get this, I just ignore it. Um, if I don't recognize the number on my phone, I don't answer the phone. Let it go to voicemail. If it's somebody that really needs to talk to me to leave a message, I'll call them back. But when you answer the call and it's one of these scam numbers, you're now on a list that there is a, there is a, a body or body at this line that's going to answer. It's a good number. And now your number winds up in all these other different places, and that's why these calls increase in frequency. When you stop answering the phone for these calls, those calls will start to decrease because they're not going to waste your time on people that don't answer the phone. Mystery shopper scam, I mean, I don't think that one even happens anymore, but no, somebody from a company will call you and encourage you to go to the store to buy things. Now listen, go to Macy's, you're going to pretend it. You're going to be a customer, and, and we want you to rate the, the interaction you have with the associate, and you're going to mail the clothes that you purchased to this address, and we'll refund you double the money that you spent. Like it, you know, it's something like that. Um, email compromise scams, uh, that's where it'll happen to your email. From there, they'll change one character in the domain. Um, this is common with business and larger organizations. Yeah, you don't really see this on the general public. It's more corporations that are billing and dealing with corporate statements. I mentioned before the lock screen scam. This is the one where the woman said that they accused her of looking at child porn on her computer. She got something similar to this. Looks well, all official and everything, right? When you get these type of screens and if it stops, there's no way to exit out or close it out, just turn the computer off. Turn the computer off, let it sit for a few minutes, put it back on, and this stuff usually disappears right after. Your computer will appear to be locked at that moment, but when you turn it back on, it's usually when it disappears. Computer repair scam, same exact thing. Somebody will pretend to be from Microsoft. You pay a subscription fee, $300, and then this thing spirals out of control. People will fall for that, they'll, they'll give them a credit card number so that they can be billed $300. And then the guy in the other line goes, oh my gosh, I accidentally billed you $1,300. My mistake, ma'am, I owe you $1,000. And now this whole thing goes around, where before you know it, you've given another five or $600 to try to make up a difference, and people are at a couple thousand again. Once control is gained, the information on your computer is compromised. Don't ever give anybody remote access to your computer unless it's something you trust. Yeah, this is like an example of all those warnings that'll pop up. Just turn the computer off. Uh, phishing scams. I'll get emails that, like I said before, with the text message from T-Bank, I'll get an email that looks like a legitimate T-Bank email. And Paige says, you know, we're, we're cleaning up our accounts, we want to confirm your account information. Please enter your information, we'll all and send this in so that we can update our records. And it's it's not a legitimate TV bag. When you send this information, you're sending it directly to a scam. All right? But it looks like a legitimate TV bag, a bag of America. You'll get it a lot of times with Google or on Amazon. Your package has been delivered. If, if you're getting this message incorrectly, please call this number or click this link. All right? You ignore them. Say ignore them. That just gets you into this revolving door of, of craziness that you can't get out of. ATM skimmers, Detective O'Brien talked about that. You know, again, try to avoid using anything that's small little convenience and corner stores. Try to use only main bank ATMs. They do a very good job of, of keeping up on uh, people modifying or adding these things to the ATM. Somebody that owns a quick check or a trousers and the ATM's there, they have no affiliation with that store. That, that's, the store is receiving money to keep the ATM there. He doesn't care what happens with it. And so these people, will put those skimmers on, and then they'll also get your, your uh, 
four-digit code numbers and stuff like that, and then they just start withdrawing money from other banks. website 
and in fact, this is just a head count of what it is. It tells you where to, to go. You can go to NCIC. And stuff. So we talked about, these are all different sites here, uh, to, to report uh, online scams, internet scams, stuff like that. You don't necessarily need to make a police report unless you have lost something. All right, if you've gotten this phone call, letting us know that it really doesn't do anything. All right, but going to one of these sites, you can report it to the FTC or IC3.gov. These are all sites that will accumulate these numbers. Telling us doesn't do anything. Now, if you've lost money, you've given them sensitive information, then by all means, make a report. For sure. You don't have to call us for a hex thing. For instance, me personally, I, I was hacked. My credit card was still showing up at my house. I'm like, oh, God, here we go. So they had everything in mind. So it should be on or anything. Wow. You got free to credit. Got a credit card company, believe it or not, they're very, very helpful. If you someone opens a credit card in your name, you call them, it's what happened, blah, 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 you send them a letter in the mail, you fill it out. That whole purpose of that is if you're caught lying, okay, they can come after you. That's what all those signatures when you mail back a letter. The police report part, now if you're out money, okay, it's different. I'm gonna police report, it's not gonna be anything crazy, but it's almost a second insurance for the credit card company. If they catch you, now you falsify the police report. And they charge, you get charged now. That's how all that, that whole There's some things we just can't investigate. If there was every credit card that was opened up in someone's name, we, it, it would be impossible. We can't do it. But big ones, we try our best. We send subpoenas out. But like I said, it's very hard once that one is gone. So in this, in this day, I'm sorry. Uh, in this day and age, things have changed. And the companies don't necessarily work with the police as well as they used to. When I would have scams 15 years ago, I would call a credit card company, I'd call a phone company. I got my answer over the phone. People were more than willing to jump through hoops to be able to help the police. We call these companies now, and they, first of all, they don't want to talk to you. They refer you to their legal department, and you go online and find out what you got to do is to, to try to get this information. It, they get 30 days to apply to us. So we're waiting 30 days to get this information, and that's what they send it every time. Half the time they ignore these orders because they don't want to cooperate with police. They'd rather protect what they call protect the customers. To protect the criminals is what they're doing. Companies in California are some of the worst because they have some of the more strictest laws where they can avoid uh, complying with these court orders. So again, it makes our job very difficult. When we had that one grandparent scam where I arrested the Uber driver, I sent a ton of subpoena requests to Uber because I wanted to find out if this driver was really involved in doing this more times outside of the, ISO, the one it's going to be arrested for. Uber refused to answer any of the subpoenas, stating, We are a foreign company, I don't need to abide by your pinkly legal requests. So I have a great day. Right? So this is, this is what we're going to against. Uh, what I mentioned that this presentation is online. If you go to Monroe Police Department website, one of the title, one of the top categories is information. Underneath information will be identity theft and identity fraud scam presentations. You can pull this up at home. Okay, and all those numbers and all those little websites, are, all these slides are on there. So uh, you know, feel free to look that up and pass this on to somebody else. And we want to thank you for giving us an email.